Suppressor's on. Soft rounds. How can bullets be soft? You want me to gag it, sir? Means they're hollow at the tip. Why? Spreads as it goes in. Doesn't come out. Be quick. Jesus Christ, I said suppressors! Sorry, I didn't... Shit! Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained, and today we'll be taking a look at The Girl with All the Gifts, the 2016 post apocalyptic zombie horror drama directed by Cole McCarthy, starring Gemma Arterton, Patty Considine, Glenn Close, and the outstanding Sanea Nanua in her film debut. Based on the novel of the same name by Mike Carey, the film follows a group of survivors trying to deal with a dystopic future plagued by a fungal infection that had, in essence, wiped out all humans it came into contact with. The novel explained that it had been 20 years since humanity had been infected by a variant of the real-life fungus known as the Ophia cordyceps unilateralis. This terrifying fungus would infect insects like the ant, and its pathogenesis would be characterised by major alterations to the host's behavioural patterns. These infected hosts would leave their nests and head down to the forest floor towards areas that had a temperature and humidity that was more suitable for fungal growth, after which they would be seen using their mandibles to affix themselves to the underside of a leaf where they would remain until death. This in turn led to the reproductive stage where fruiting bodies would grow from the ant's head before rupturing to release the fungus spores. It's not a film about the event of uh, the zombie apocalypse, it's a film that's about the remnants of human beings moving around in a world that's already taken back over by nature. All those that were infected by the cordyceps variant were called hungries due to the fact that they would begin to lose their cognitive ability and were seen feeding on the flesh of healthy humans to satiate the fungus. And while the main form of transmission was through blood and saliva exchange, we'll soon come to find out that the infection also had a reproductive stage that enabled it to spread its spores. In the UK, where the infection had originated, there were a handful of survivors living in either heavily fortified camps or out in the open in hostile packs. One of these camps in Beacon was also a remote military base that was being used to study a group of child hungries that had been captured, who seemingly were able to retain their mental prowess and only lost control when they got too close to the scent of a human. Led by Sergeant Eddie Parks, who was a battle-hardened, non-commissioned officer, his soldiers would recover these infected youths and bring them back to the base, where they were simultaneously educated by teachers and tested by the head scientist, Dr. Caroline Caldwell. Believing that she was close to finding a cure, Dr. Caldwell would vivisect those that were infected, hoping to find answers to the riddle in their brain and spinal matter, much to the disapproval of Helen, a behavioural psychologist and teacher at the base who began developing an empathetic connection with her class, and more specifically, with a young, gifted girl known as Melanie who adored her. While the majority of the classes and timetable revolved around education, the children seemed to love hearing stories from Helen and constantly beg her to retell the classic Greek myths like the story of Odysseus and Pandora, who was a woman created by the gods as a punishment who carried a box of gifts that contained sickness, death and evil which would be released onto the world. These unique children received the fungal infection from their mothers who were infected during pregnancy and had essentially eaten their way out of the womb before being found by the soldiers in the maternity ward. These hybrids, known as neonites, formed a symbiotic relationship with the cordyceps infection. And just like the venom symbiote that would take control to protect its host, the infection would take over the children to ensure that they were both fed. The fungus was also able to metabolize their oxygen, and this symbiotic relationship granted the neonites superhuman speed and reflexes. I don't get to breathe as often as you do. At the base, I used to hold my breath and count to a thousand. <sighs> the fungus metabolizes your oxygen for you. While Caldwell came across as cold and slightly inhumane, she admitted that she constantly struggled with the role that she had, questioning herself to determine whether the infected youths were being controlled by the cordyceps infection the whole time, or whether the kids were in fact human. This was clear with her numerous interactions with Melanie, trying to ascertain whether her behavior was purely mimicry or proof of an individualized personality. Here's another, there's a cat in a box. It could be alive or it could be dead, 50-50. How would you find out? You'd open the box and look inside. Before that, when the box is closed. 
I'll have to think about it. Exquisite. Mimicry of observed behaviors. Question mark. What does that mean? That means the jury's still out. Although this was also another test to gauge Melanie's IQ, this was more specifically a reference to Melanie herself, who, like Schrodinger's cat, was both alive and dead. Vivisecting Melanie and thereby opening the box is also guaranteed the killer, posing the question of when quantum superposition ended and reality collapsed into one possibility or the other. At first, you couldn't help but feel sorry for the kids being strapped to the chairs who looked at the soldiers with gleeful ignorance, unaware that there was something wrong with them. We could also see that the way they were being treated was deeply affecting Helen, who struggled to deal with the fact that the Neo Knights were both children and monsters at the same time. Satisfied with their findings, Dr. Coldwell organized a dissection of Melanie, only to have the procedure interrupted by both Helen and a horde of infected that had broken into the base, forcing Coldwell, Helen, Melanie, Eddie, and a handful of remaining soldiers to flee the compound in an armored truck. After their truck broke down, the group made their way to London on foot, which was surrounded by thousands of infected that were passively waiting for the scent of humans. Making their way into a building to rest for the night, the group then awoke the next morning to find that their building was now surrounded by the Hungries, leading Melanie to volunteer to get rid of them by finding an animal that they could chase. Due to the fact that the Hungries were not drawn to the scent of neo knights like Melanie, she proved to be quite useful to the group, helping them get out of sticky situations, which in turn led the others to change how they perceived her. As they progressed further into London, they came across a mass of infected bodies encircling an overgrown tower that Caldwell explained was a massive fungal growth containing seed pods, which if released, could end humankind. We also discovered that the Cordyceps fungus had two stages in its life cycle, first infecting people that it could then command, before grouping the infected together to sprout growths that ultimately created a singular, fully matured superorganism. This massive structure would use the collective nutrients of its host to produce thousands of seed pods known as sporangia, which once opened had the potential to spread the infection globally. Although the pods were encased in a tough shell that was almost impossible to open by force, they responded to heat and moisture and were essentially waiting on extreme weather to usher in a new dawn of civilization. After finding an abandoned mobile laboratory in the middle of the city, Coldwell, who was also injured and suffering from a septic infection, kept insisting that she could still save the human race and create a vaccine by sacrificing Melanie, much to the disapproval of Helen. It should also be noted that by this time, Melanie had started to grow in both Eddie and Kieran, who began seeing her less as a monster and more like a child. Leaving the confines of the mobile lab to look for food and supplies, Kieran was unfortunate enough to encounter a herd of neo nuts that had developed their own non-verbal language and hierarchy in a parentless world. These cunning predators were seen laying traps for their human prey in the form of canned food, using it to lure Kieran into an enclosed shop before pouncing on him. I mean, these guys were like wolves, viciously injuring their prey before closing in on him in a merciless attack. While Helen and Eddie soon arrived on the scene and were probably able to shoot most of them down, Melanie did not wish for them to die and instead decided to emulate their behavior and assert dominance over the pack of hunters by defeating the Alpha Neo Knight in a savage display. Don't look at them! Shut up! Just at me! Pretend you're really scared of me! Pretend. Upon their return, Caldwell sedated the group and confronted Melanie, begging her to willingly allow herself to be sacrificed for the sake of humanity. And while it initially appeared as though Melanie was going to acquiesce, she changed her mind after the doctor admitted that she had finally concluded the neo Knights were not mimicking behavior, but were actually alive. This revelation led Melanie to realize that she and the rest of her kind were just as entitled to the Earth as the humans, and we saw her head to the tower with a box of matches with the intention of setting it alight. Coldwell, who followed the girl out of the mobile lab, was then attacked by a pack of neo knights just as Melanie set light to the tower, bringing about the destruction of humankind with her gift, much like Pandora had done in the stories the children would hear from Helen. Eddie, who had left the laboratory in search of Melanie, began to succumb to the spores within a few minutes, and after finding her, we saw him beg Melanie to shoot him before he changed. The film then ended to reveal a tearful Helen inside the mobile lab who is now the sole human survivor of the infection, teaching Melanie and a handful of second generation neo knights just as she had done at the start of the film, only this time their roles had been reversed, with Helen forced to live out her life imprisoned in the lab while the children listened to her from outside. For me, the film's success stems from its ability to make you sympathetic to both the humans who were determined to survive the infection and the neo knights which were the next step in human evolution. 
This struggle was perfectly personified through Dr. Caldwell, who represented the collective wisdom and hope for humanity, and the young Melanie, who was a representation of inevitable change. I can't stress how magnificent Sania is as Melanie, who was only 12 at the time of shooting and had managed to sculpt a character that was both intelligent and emotionally complex, literally carrying the weight of the film on her shoulders as the entire story was mostly told through her point of view. She was also the last actor that auditioned for the role, out of the 500 that had been shortlisted, and within a few minutes, both Cole McCarthy and Mike Carey realised that they had found their Melanie. I'm amazed, to be honest with you, I, I, if I was... When I was that age, there's no way I'd be able to deal with all of that. And she's in practically every scene. I think she's a remarkable little girl. Obviously incredibly intelligent and, and has a lot of soul. By the end of the first week, we knew that, you know, she had the metal for it, but also that she was creating a really, really special performance. You saved me like in your story. It wasn't like my story. I ate bits of the soldiers. The girl in my story didn't eat people. Principal photography for the film began on the 17th of May 2015 and lasted seven weeks, taking the cast and crew throughout numerous locations around the UK, while the aerial views of the deserted city were filmed with drones in the abandoned Ukrainian town of Pripyat, which has been uninhabited since the 1986 Chernobyl disaster. By the first five pages, I, I knew that it was something that I think is special. I immediately said yes after one read. Up against the fence, gang. Is that all the A's there? Buddy up against the fence. Ah! Yeah, we've got zombies and it's great, but the, the central story is um, a lot more heartfelt and emotional than, than that. Cut. Cut it You know, it spoke to me about the sort of fragility of human beings and the fact that we we run this planet so we think, but the planet will survive quite happily without our existence. Well, that's all for today, folks. Thanks to all of you guys who requested we take a look at the girl with all the gifts. If there's any other stuff you'd like me to check out, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. Babies can't eat people. These ones did. The mothers were probably all infected at once in a single incident then the embryos they were carrying took the infection as well. In dissection, it's very clear. The fungus is wrapped around your brain like ivy around an oak tree. But I can talk. I'm like you. You're not like anything that's ever existed before.